It is my pleasure to introduce to you my friend, Dr. Scott Harrell. For the last 22 years, Dr. Harrell has served as a professor in the Systematic Theology Department here at DTS. He received a BA from Seattle Pacific University and then his THM and his THD uh, right here at Dallas Seminary. He was also a visiting scholar at Tyndall House, Cambridge, England in 1993. Much of his life prior to DTS and since has been in teaching and church planting in various parts of the world. One of his greatest loves and burdens is for the emerging global church, especially for its theological leadership. His second passion is for biblical and systematic theology, getting things right from the word of God and applying such truths to our lives. Wherever people love God, they love to understand more deeply the scriptures. Scott has been married to his wife, Ruth, for 45 years, which has also encompassed moving 37 times. Think about that for a minute. Yeah, think about that for a minute. <laughs> Their daughters, Ray and Crystal, are married to DTS grads who love the Lord and combine business and missions, and they have eight grandchildren. Please join with me in welcoming Dr. Scott Harrell to our pulpit today. Thank you, Chaplain. <laughs> Yeah, a few of those times I had to go back and get Ruth as we moved, and uh, she stayed behind as I tried to move on, and uh, she stuck with me. She's precious. Well, thank you for the joy of speaking with you uh, this morning. It is uh, my delight, and there are things that I want to share with you that I think are important, but at the same time, and I think a lot of professors feel this way, I don't want to preach, all right? I want to talk with you uh, yeah, some theology, but, but uh, if I can say friend to friend, it, it might be a little heavy sometimes, but yeah, how, how, how wondrous our God's truth is. And so I'd, I'd kind of like to share that with you as we kick off this morning. I'm tired. Uh, you're tired. I know that. And here we are together yet to worship and glorify our God. I am reminded uh, that I was supposed to wear jeans like Chaplain Joe has on today, but I thought, well, what's, what's a mature man to do? You go and try to find jeans, and they start out with slim, and then it goes extra slim, then it goes ultra slim, and then it starts with skinny, and skinny, skinny. What's a 70-year-old man supposed to do, you know? <laughs> So I thought I'd better not wear jeans anyway. I, I can think of some who will probably still be wearing jeans at 75 or 80, and uh, skinny jeans no less. Uh, God bless them. Uh, several, several years ago, I was in Chennai, India, and there uh, a, an Indian family of believers came to uh, welcome me there. I was already supposed to be in a hotel at that point, and uh, this dear brother, his son, was here at, uh, at DTS, and, and the daughter who was with him at that point came to DTS after that. I don't need this, do I, Jim? So I'm going to shove that aside. And uh, in any case, he was talking with this rather large hotel manager. And not only was the hotel large, the, man, the manager was quite large, too, apparently a Christian believer of sorts. And my friend, the, the father of this young lady, had his back to me as he was explaining what this gringo is doing here in Chennai at the hotel. And in a big booming voice, the, the hotel manager said, theologian, what's a theologian for? Why do we need a theologian? And uh, I don't know what my friend was feeling, but I thought I was about 30 or 40 feet away, and I thought, that's interesting. That's a question I've asked myself a lot of times since. Theologian, what good is a theologian? What's a theologian for? So I, yeah, I ask it in our department. Is it Dr. Kreider, Dr. Spiegel, what is a theologian, and what, are, what good are they for? We don't always have answers. So today I want to just talk to you as sort of a teacher, all right, who happens to love the Word of God in all of this. And I'd like, again, though, to talk about that, which I talk about in classes sometimes because it's so close to my heart as uh, we enter this area today. There are times when, when the distractions are gone around our lives, we begin to ask the question, who am I? And when we ask, who am I, it leads into then, what am I? I'm a human being, but 
Who am I? Maybe think back in your own life. Think back to when perhaps you were in grade school and just sitting, suddenly you were all alone and you were, wow, here I am, wondering. Maybe, maybe you had some fear or an, 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 uh, anticipation or whatever it might be. I mean, I was putting time out a number of times in grade school, so you're sitting there alone, hoping your father doesn't come in or something like that, uh, who did once. Uh, but then middle school, when we're all trying to figure out who are we, and I'm, I'm, not as, I'm not as tall as that person, or girls thinking, I wish I weren't this tall because all the boys are so short, or I'm not pretty, or I'm not smart, or I'm not that good of athlete. And so, so we try to define who we are. We're negotiating with life around us, but sometimes there's that hollow question in the middle, who am I? Who am I, as we just sang? We get into high school and, well, we get a little more introspective, I hope, at least most of us do, and we ask, who am I? But still we're negotiating with life around us, trying to understand. And then in college universities, by then we're being pressed with some of the harder questions, even in high school many times. We're being told that, well, we are genomes and DNA, but what else are we as human beings? And so then into the professional world, uh, whether single or married, whether dating, that's a mess too, trying to understand who am I and how do I fit into all of this? How does life work? And maybe you are married and sometimes they're thinking, well, my life is now bound with this other person. I'm not sure I always like them. Stanley Hauerhaus has a, has a nice little saying, we, we always married the wrong person, as he puts it. Well, only in the sense that we have, you know, in our lives, we, we step back and say, who am I and how, what is the, the very foundation of my being? And some of you are, you know, you've got children and their, their identity is bound to you and yours to them. Some of you are divorced. Some of you are widowed. And so you feel that death or that betrayal or whatever else it was that led to now feeling really quite lonely as we sit, as we ponder, as we look, as we look toward our God. There are today 7.8 billion people in the world, 7.8 billion people in the world, and of course the world is growing. That uh, doesn't seem like so much because we hear these figures quite a lot, but before, uh, uh, after virtually all of you were born, in simply the year 2000, 20 years ago, there was only 6.14 billion people in the world. That is, we have grown not quite 20, uh, 2 billion people in the world, but, but the world is growing. All the more when we step back to the beginning of last century, to 1900. In 1900, there were only 1 1.6 billion people in the world. That's 20% of what exists today. So your great-great-grandparents are however far back you have to go, but 20% of the world was present then to what is compared today. Wow, then we go back to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and discover that there are, there are at his time estimated, the World Population Reference Bureau and other research in this area says there were about 170 million people in the world when Jesus walked this earth. 170 million people is about 2%, 2.18% of the world population today. That is, for, for, every thou, or for every 100 people there were, today there were two then, two and a fifth, I guess you'd say. We go all the way back to David, and we'll be looking at one of his psalms in just a minute, and it's estimated that there were about 50 million people in the world. 50 million people. That is less than 1%. That is like 0.0. 0.64% of the world population was present today, was present then. 0.64 to be precise. That is amazing. And yet the basic questions of life have remained the same, haven't they? They continue on. And a lot of that orients around, well, who am I and what am I as a, as a human being? The, the West has largely kept the West, so-called once Christian West, has largely assumed the values of Christianity. As many like Tom Holland 
and other secular historians are saying today, it was Christianity that established our Western values. And yet now that Christianity is eroding out from beneath, there is no longer a foundation for the very values we assume in the UN charters of human rights and religious freedom and all of this, giving innate universal dignity to humankind. Yet as Friedrich Nietzsche said, the why is lacking. There's no foundation there anymore in the secular world around us. Well, where do we go? As evangelicals, we have, we've been pretty good about telling people that they are sinners and separated from God and they need a savior. But that kind of language today often doesn't even resonate with people. First of all, God, what is God? But sin, what is sin? We've been very good about telling people they're sinners. Usually people, that's what think, they think that's what church people say. But we haven't been very good about saying, do you realize you are created in the image of God? You are made in God's image. That's far, far above any religion or any philosophy in the world. God says we are made especially and uniquely by Him. But it says something else too. It says we are the highest of all creation, far beyond Islam, far beyond other religions, but we are also the lowest spiritually, morally. There's no ladder we can crawl up. There's no five obligations of Islam. There's no certain rituals we do through Hinduism or Buddhism or whatever other religion. We are utterly, utterly separate from God. We have no merit in ourselves. So we need to hold the two together. That paradox of the highest of all humankind or of all creation on this earth and yet the lowest. Spiritually, we do need a savior. But we've been good about saying you're a sinner. We haven't been good about saying you are created in the image of God. Well, there's three passages I want to look at, and I'd like you to go there with me, and these are familiar to you. Let's begin in Psalm 8, this lovely Psalm of David. Psalm 8, if you'll go there with me. We looked a little bit at it this week, I believe. Lord, our Lord, that is Yahweh Adonai, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. I love that verse. We'll come back to it. When I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. Let's stop there for a minute. So David, maybe in the Judean wilderness, maybe by now in Jerusalem, who knows? But he didn't have all the lights of night that we do that pretty much obscure the stars around us. It is said that with a naked eye, on a clear night, we can see about 5,000 stars. I suppose that's globally, so if you're in the south, you see different ones. But putting it all together, about 5,000 stars are discernible by the human eye. But of course, to our astonishment as a human race, as we learn a little more and a little more and a little more about this universe, certainly over the last 40, 30, 20, 10 years, to begin to understand that what? There are at least 200 billion galaxies with trillions upon trillions upon trillions of stars. It is said there are more stars in the universe than there is sand, pebbles of sand in all the earth, in the ocean, in the Sahara Desert, wherever it might be, more stars out there than sand in all this planet. That is astonishing, isn't it? And yet I'm sure David sometimes felt, looking out into space, who am I? as he continues on when he says, what is mankind? He's saying, who am I? What are we? That you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them. You've made them a little lower than the angels, or really the word is Elohim, the heavenly beings. You've made humankind a little less than whether angels or heavenly beings or even God. And again, the term is Elohim, God himself. Wow. And so you've made them rulers. Oh, you've crowned them with glory and honor. You've made them rulers over the work of your hands. You put everything under their feet. Flocks, herds, goes on from there. That verse 2 is kind of interesting, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll cite this time the, the Christian Standard Version. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies. That is, even the tiniest little newborn baby or 
infant that's still nursing from the mother's breast, the gooing and cooing that goes on, even that declares as firm testimony in all the world the majesty of who we are as human beings. You know, I think of, well, Richard Dawkins, divorced three times, separated from his third wife. I don't know if he had kids. Or Bertrand Russell, or how many others that these uh, notorious atheists, uh, Sam Harris or whoever it might be, what happens when they, if they do it all, hold a little baby, their little baby in their own arms and think, well, this is DNA, these are genomes. Is there no wonder? Psalm 8, <laughs> verse 2 is saying, those little infants are greater testimony than anything you can imagine. They stand against the enemies and foes of God. Babies, as well as all the rest, are testimony to who is, who is our God. I find that utterly beautiful. And what is mankind, inosh, the Hebrew term, really mankind in our finitude, our weakness many times. And then what is uh, human beings, the ben Adam, the sons of man, that you care for them? We see here that as we ask, who are we, God? God tells us through his word, through, through David, by the inspiration of the Spirit, we are created a little bit less than God and the angels. And that this God, this creator God, is mindful of us and cares for us and has crowned us with glory and honor and put everything under our feet. That's the intention, as you well know. And so, and so in the short psalm, of course, David ends, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Wow. Well, it helps us sometimes to understand this, the biblical view of what is human, alongside other major religions of the world. We put it beside pantheism, for example, where everything is God and God is everything. Advaita Hinduism is perhaps the, the backdrop philosophically for much Hinduism in the world, in spite of all the gods that are worshipped and so forth. And that is that finally, finally, God is everything, and everything is God. And so to enter into oneness with this one absolute which englobes everything, we have to expunge, put out, we have to... Uh, uh, put aside our humanity to transcend our finitude, to transcend our humanity, to enter into the one. And so with the trillions of cycles of reincarnation, there are some human beings who are actually below animals. So you have cows roaming the streets and monkeys and elephants and cobra and all the rest, and yet the untouchables there. These emanations, but always our humanity gets in the way of our entering God. One thinks of what? Animism and spiritism and tribal religions and the occult today as well. And there you have, you have us in, these, in, a, in a massive what schema or hierarchy of different beings. Some are greater than we are, some are lesser than we are. There's ancestral spirits, there's little gods, there's big gods. But here we are trying to negotiate, not get hurt by other spirits or gods, trying to negotiate our way through these hierarchy of spirit beings. But what is human? What is man? That's hardly answered. We, speak, we, we switch over to a, something like Buddhism, particularly Zen Buddhism. There we step away even further from, from what we are because Zen and many other forms of Buddhism say, hey, there is no God and there is no self. And there, there is no sin, and it goes on from there. All we have is a momentary consciousness of our different relations and energies of life, and that momentary consciousness is moving. And when you take everything else away, there's nothing, nothing at all in the middle. There is no self. And then you take atheism. Again, another major worldview out there. What are we saying? Atheism, the human being is increasingly seen merely in matter or naturalist terms. And so there we are. Uh, the human being, your brain is simply your brain. You might think you have a soul or you have some control over your control panel. Not at all. It's all been destined. You are DNA. You are genomes. And there is no soul in you either. And this is a meaningless universe. So when you die, it's all over. The best you can do is, is pick up on your own algorithms or something like that and make the best of this life because this is, this is all there is. We are, you are DNA 
and you have extraordinary luck to be where you're at in a meaningless universe. But when we turn to the Word of God, when we turn to the Bible as we've just seen, who are you? Who am I? What is mankind? David cries out. We are created a little lower than the angels, than God himself. The Creator is mindful and cares for all humanity, and he's given us glory, honor, and made us to rule. Well, we all have to sometimes, I hope you do, turn off social media, turn off the television or the music or whatever you typically surround yourself, the noise that we have. We have to ask ourselves, who are we? Who are we and what are we? And I share this in a lot of classes, but this is a defining moment in my life, with a lot of other ones too, but as I after college came out and ended up being an interim pastor in Bellevue, Washington. Now, I was 21 and an English literature major, so what did I know? But here was a church of largely executives. And, and they, knew, they knew after my first sermon, it took me two or three to figure out, I didn't have anything to say to these people. But after that interim pastorate, I have to tell you, I felt very discouraged and asking, what is the church? And, and asking questions of life. It did work out for my going to Switzerland to live at a place called La Brie, the shelter with Francis Schaeffer. I was going to a number of people were there at that time. And, and it was good to begin to get some answers. But during that time, I also got a letter from a girlfriend. And it was, hey, I found somebody else. Sorry, good luck. And uh, that, I thank God for that letter. But We've all probably experienced some kind of rejection like that in our lives, but it was as though that was a straw on the camel's back that began to push me into myself. And I began to ask, well, who am I and what am I? Because the question of who am I, Scott, is pretty meaningless if there's not a greater superstructure of what we are as human beings. And so as I began to ask, who am I? And why do people talk about stupid things all the time and laugh and all this chatter and all the rest? began to think, this is crazy. This is an absurd life. And as I contemplated more and more and looked into myself, it was like I was falling into this massive sand pit or black hole, really. There was nothing below. And I'd try to grab a root here or something there, and it would all give way because there was no answer to who am I. So be careful when you tell people to look into yourself, as the Greek philosophers did, discover yourself, if you're thoughtful at all, you'll find out there's nothing there unless there's a lot bigger structure than this. And, yeah. Well, a friend at that point, he was a roommate at Labrie, uh, wisely said to me, he said, stop looking into yourself. Start looking up. That's it. And that was, well, yeah, why didn't I think of that? And that's when I was struggling with this doctrine of the Trinity. I'm glad I got one amen there. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Start looking up, and many a theologian has said the same. We look up to define who we are. I mean, biblical scholars will say there's really not a psychology. There's not a, a detailing of bits and pieces of what we are as humans. Heart means one thing in, in Solomon and another thing in John. So the Bible designs us to define ourselves. We have, we have to look up. And so I'll tell you that was glorious. To begin to understand who God is then defines who I am. And I was rather glad that there was no psychiatrist on hand to give me drugs to help me forget the questions, as many do today. Well, Psalm 8, we're made a little lower than the Elohim. Let's go to another passage, bedrock for anthropology for all of us. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. That's even easy to find, isn't it, in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27 which tells us something even more. Sure, we're made lower than God, uh, but now even another wonderful truth. Then God said, let us make man or mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals. Some of that's picked up in Psalm 8, as we've seen. Over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humankind or mankind in his own image 
In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He blessed them and said, be fruitful, increase, uh, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, etc. Well, then asa, let us make, is an exhortative plural in the Hebrew. So it's uh, Umberto Casutu and other Hebrew scholars, a rabbinic uh, Hebrew university uh, scholar says this cannot be talking to angels. Some will say maybe that's what Moses was thinking. Who knows? But it's there in the text. Let us make man in our own image. And then it goes right on to say our, his, he. Not asa is what make. But then in the next verse, bara, bara, that create, create, create. Only God creates. And so we're kind of pushed back to that verse and say this must be God who's talking to himself in some way, deliberative plural or some kind, and saying, let's make humanity in our image. Well, lots and lots and lots has been written on this verse, and certainly, certainly also on, on uh, what is the image of God. And typically, as we talk about the imago Dei, typically what is said is, well, there is a structural harmony. There's an ontology to what we are. That's what was really meaningful to me at the beginning because God thinks and God wills and God has affections and God is moral and upright. And Romans 1 and other passages, of course, talk about, well, that's, that's God's evidence in us. We're created in God's image. And so, yeah, the Father thinks and wills and feels the Son thinks and wills and feels. The Spirit does the same. And we see this as the canon unfolds in the New Testament. This let us, as the patristic fathers almost unanimously argued, this let us is a, a hint, is a directive toward what we see later on, the doctrine of the Trinity. We have three persons in one God. Well, for me, that was transformative as well. Well, some would say the image of God then is innate to what we are, that we think, that we will, we have self-determination, at least in many, many ways, that we have affections and, and emotions and desires, and many of those are expressed in the Bible, that we have a sense of afterlife, that we have a sense of creativity, that we know, as in a graduate school, we're to dominate or master certain things. We have a moral conscience in all of that. All of that takes us to help understand something innate to ourselves. But it's not only that. As we continue, male and female, he created them. So there's a whole another dimension that unpacks as we walk through Scripture. And that is the relational dimension of what we are. We don't do well as rocks and islands in this world. We need others to define us. And we are defined by our parents, by our friends, by our brothers and sisters, by, again, in relationships of one kind or another. We are defined also by others around us. And that's good, and that's the way it is to be. Really, we're defined by God more than all, as we've already said. So there's the relational aspect of what we are. In the East, as I mentioned with Zen Buddhism, if you take away all the external, there's nothing in the middle. The Bible says, no, there is something in the middle. You alone, individually, are created in the image of God, but that's not all you are. Just as the Father is eternally the Father because he has an eternal Son. As we think about the Godhead, there's both a unity of nature, yet the distinction of persons, and they are defined one by the other. That's life for us, too. We're in process. You know, I, I once was a kid, a son, and then later a dad, then the Father, and on from there. But we are defined by our relationships. Genesis 1 is especially clear on we are also defined by our activity, our function. So we are to subdue, we are to rule, we are to be caretakers of this world. But all of us, female, male alike, are created in God's image. Kind of a parenthesis here. William Wilberforce and others were arguing that very strongly in the United Kingdom when the United Kingdom outlawed slavery. But along comes Charles Darwin and says, no, there's a struggle for survival and survival of the fittest. And the white elite of England grabbed that very quickly as they had conquered India, conquered much of Africa, conquered other parts of the world and said, we are the superior race over all the others. There's a distinction 
There is not a unity of, and that undid what Wilberforce and others tried to do in much of that. Well, who are we? We are defined innately in what we are internally, relationally with other people, and functionally. We are created to be productive in this life, aren't we? Well, there's more to who God is than we can express. There's more to what is human than we can express as well. Well, <clears throat> there's one other text that I think is helpful for us. Now, wait a minute. I want to go back just a little bit. <clears throat> because even understanding the word person is really important. Because person, prosopon, and persona were in Greek and Latin before Christ. We see it even in the Septuagint in the Bible. But not in a defined term like we use it today. In fact, it was usually the mask in either language for an actor as they were in a stage. And so it could be the same person with different masks, and that didn't reflect the Trinity. God's not manifesting in different ways, but really one person. Well, as we get to Tertullian, a lawyer in, by that point, from North Africa into Rome, he used persona in a different way, and that's because it had evolved in the Latin legal use to say, no, that's an individual with rights in and of themselves. So Tertullian, the great definer for Western and all theology of the Trinity as tres persona et una substantia, three persons, one substance, and that became the template. But even persona wasn't well defined then. And the Greeks had more trouble with it because the Greek language didn't change like the Latin. And so we get to the fourth century and along come the Cappadocians. You don't have to know all of this background, but they said, we need a stronger word than prosopon. Yeah, person, but it's too ambiguous. It could be modalism. So let's use another word. And they did, hypostasis which means this distillment, the solidity of each of the persons. And as uh, a well-known uh, Eastern or Orthodox scholar says today, those Cappadocians saw in God real relations between Father and Son, communication and the Holy Spirit. And there was real, real beauty that was there. Well, still, what is a person didn't get well defined? Boethius said, which kind of was the template for the West, a person is a rational individual. We're marked by our mind. And that continued through much of what, as an individual, no less. That continued through Western history. We get to Descartes, the beginning of the Enlightenment. I think, therefore I am. That's the template for the West until people began to ask, what is, what is rationality? Where does that come from? We began to realize, well, that's sort of arbitrary too, isn't it? So existentialists began to say, well, a person then is someone who authenticates themselves by acts of the will. Doesn't matter quite, quite as much what you actually do with those acts, but you're authenticating yourself. And by now, in postmodernism, all of that has pretty much broken away. But what is beautiful as we go back to Scripture, we begin to see person really is defined as we look at Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the way that unfolds in Scripture. Well, so there's the innate, there's the relational, there is, there is the functional. But there's more than that, and there's one more passage I want you to turn to. This could be one of many, but turn to Hebrews chapter, chapter 2. You might recall that, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 to 11, you might recall that uh, in chapter 1 of Hebrews, it's very clear the author is saying Jesus Christ is, the Son is the exact representation of God, the very essence of God. For us, angels worship Him. And so in chapter 1, we have the deity of Christ. In chapter 2, suddenly we shift to the humanity of Christ. You see the two natures side by side without a lot of explanation, but the text goes deep, deep in both ways. And so I've got to jump into the middle of the text. Interestingly, Psalm 8 is quoted as we step into our text then. Verse 8 uh, finishing Psalm 8, uh, and put everything under his feet. You made him a little lower than the angels, crowned, him with, crowned them with glory and honor, put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. That is, it's a broken, messy, distorted world that we live in. Verse 9, 
Hebrews 2, 9. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor. That is the archetypal man right there. Because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation, that is Jesus, perfect through what he suffered. So both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy, that is Jesus, and the rest of us are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. So there's a lot more to what it means to be a person. And the Christological dimension, Jesus is called the image of God three times in the New Testament by Paul. He's the perfect image of God that we have, we are yet created in, but ours is defaced. Ours is distorted by sin and alienation from God. Jesus is the archetype who makes the way, the pioneer, the firstborn among many brethren, firstborn among the dead. And he has assumed a human nature forever and ever, yet while being fully God as well. So there is the Christological dimension. There is the eschatological dimension. Because as Christ paved the way, so we too, we too, will be made like Christ. We will have glorified bodies as he died, resurrected, ascended into heaven, and was glorified and is entirely God at the same time. Yet we too, as he went before us, we will, if Christ does not return first, die, resurrect, there'll be a rapture, and then glorification. So what is a person? We'll discover a whole lot more in the future than we know right now. Well, it's being increasingly predicted, as most of you know, that this coronavirus will continue into next year that even with, a, even with a vaccination of one kind or another, uh, it will continue into spring. There are more than 34 million who are infected today, and there are over 1 million, so those 34 million infected, 1 million who have died already, and that number will likely grow, even as perhaps it'll be contained in this country, but Brazil, India, many other places are experiencing this as well. So, yesterday we heard in chapel, Dr. Edwards spoke about this pandemic angst that we all feel. Well, that is going to continue. Social isolation will continue. We will be alone many times when we really don't want to be. So, we can begin to ask, Lord, who are we? Help us in all of this. Help us to understand that we are created in your image, and yet we are also defined by those around us, but above everything else, defined by you. So when you're about to go to sleep at night, in those kind of quiet or dull moments, maybe you just go out like a light, like I do, but, or when you wake up in the morning and have time to think, reflect again on who we are is possible and is made glorious because of who God is. So, hallelujah. Our Lord, we thank you that you have made us in so many ways that reflect who you are. And you're beyond our words and beyond our understanding in so many ways, but you've given us your word and you've come to us in such spectacularly personal terms. And so, we do have a foundation. We do have a framework for who we are and what we are. And now that we have been redeemed, now that we have been uh, reconciled with you, the God of life, we pray that you would help us, even in this hard time, to reflect on that beauty and reflect out to others by your Holy Spirit the life and reality of what you have made us in your image, now redeemed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.